I'd like to introduce Herb and one of our great public speakers here in Maine. Come up and entertain us. Oh, 1969. Amen, age hath not stale thy infinite variety, and the thing just turned off. Uh, most excellent. That's not what we're looking for, but we're going to get it. Ah, there it is. There we are. Age has not stale thy infinite variety. May 1969 opened with a 10 inch snowfall. A stormy start for a very stormy year. Change, challenge, the modern day at our door and knocking hard. Here is its history. Draw a deep breath. I have exactly 14 minutes and a half left. Here we go. This is a piece of land like no other. The most valuable of two lots in all of Maine. In the middle, Route 302 going up northward through North Windham. To the left, the road many of us just took to get here to St. Joe's. In the center, the late lamented and much beloved Dairy Queen. And straight ahead, straight ahead, the future. That is the first structure, upper right, of the North Wyndham Mall. Across the street today is Walmart. The mauling of Maine has begun. 1969 is a year of frantic construction and frantic destruction. The influx of federal dollars and the outflux of people from the old city centers. Urbanites become suburbanites. Barely 40 years after Henry Ford made flivers affordable, the auto has conquered all. Mainers love to drive long distances. Mainers hate to take more than a few steps from parking to shopping. <laughs> Hence, the age of the mall. And here is the main mall as it listed 1969. Jordan Marsh, Main Street, out in the asphalt field. But you still have old cities. And you still have old main streets. Now what happens to them? Answer, urban renewal. It's the model city versus the modern mall. This is the city, look well, because it is soon to be no more. To the left is Congress Street going up at that V. To the right in the V is uh, Free Street. To the far right here going up, Look for it only in dreams, it does not exist now. This is Spring Street, and the Museum of Art is the building that is down here in the clutch of elm trees. Next year, 1970, the removal of all of that will begin, and all the houses that are there. Now, this is to allow cars into the city. How do you tie the tide of cars together? Answer, Interstate 295, one of the great beginnings of 1969. This is a one point, and this is a $19 million project, the largest highway construction project in the history of the state of Maine, aside from the building of the Maine Turnpike. A tri-town affair of ramps and bridges and grading and draining, 20 feet of fill all along the line, just to build the loop of road atop it. The future is here, and we drove over it to get here today. And incidentally, only things we forget are new. The dotted line stopping in the center of the screen is the route of the 19th century Portland to Rochester, New York Railroad. Still works. Transit is transit. Now, in 1969, towns faced shared spreading population, shared sprawl, shared pollution, shared finite resources, and shared, therefore, regional problems. But there can there be a shared regional answer to any of them. There had been an organization called the Greater Portland Regional Planning Commission that had valiantly strained for many years, since 1956, to find that. The proposed organization, of which you are now the part, is COG, a Council of Governments. The commission was made of appointed reps from the towns, 
11 of them. The Council of Governments is made up of elected officials from the member towns. And this man that you see there, Mr. Henry E. Warren, who is remembered by a few in this room, is the last executive director of both. That is, he's the executive director of the commission and has to show the path for the council, if it can be done. It says the article uh, there, you like a challenge, Mr. Warren? Good luck, unquote. <laughs> now, no state is an island. The six New England governors in July 1969 gathered at the Black Point Inn in Scarborough. Maine's Governor Curtis, the man second from the left, in the hat, the youngest, still with us, is the chair. All are worrying about energy sources, what will provide our heating and our lighting in the future. Therefore, all that you see on there support the oil refinery to be built at Machias Port, Maine. One half billion barrels of oil to be landed a day by Occidental Petroleum. And yet, all want to stop air, water, and such pollution. And all wonder, can even a region of states work together? Simultaneously with this, with their meeting, as Americans, governors approach our problems, America approaches the moon. And the best picture I could find, mid-flight of Apollo 11, Earth's first human trans-world exploration, is this sweet picture of a Cub Scout parade in South Portland. That Cub Scout is looking heavenward. His face is beautific. The future is all ahead of him. Where is he now? Now, as America approaches the moon, big oil approaches Casco Bay, and in fact, dips its toe. First, I want to show you Congress Street. This must be one of the very early sidewalk art festivals put on by Channel 6. Every building you see exists. Not one of the companies still exists. Here, looking the other direction, up Congress Street, Ryan's Department Store, who remembers? Owen Moore, who remembers? Rogers Jewelers, who remembers? All, all gone. Now, King Resources out in Casco Bay, King Resources of Denver, pays $203,000, be $2.4 billion today, for 173 acres of Long Island and its uh, World War II underground storage tanks. Um, they propose a $100 million super tanker terminal, be $2.5 billion uh, today, for Alaskan crude to be brought from Alaska, and 300,000 barrels of it a day refined and stored on Long Island. The city fathers of Portland are going to have to rezone to allow that to happen. Under the pressure of 300,000 taxable barrels of oil a day, they are bending. These very polite ladies from Long Island, Maine, are picketing City Hall. Long Island was still part of the city of Portland then. Long Island, where are you? I know you have people here. Hello, there you are. This would have been your future. Remember their polite faces in light of what is to come in the next few slides. It is now what is commonly called the V-Mall. Here's Jordan Marsh, continuing to state, uh, take shape. 200,000 square feet of retail on two floors. It's the largest commercial development in Maine history, aside from the South Portland shipyards in World War II, with a restaurant going to be on top. And it is announced in 1969 that a Sears, yay, is going to be built on the 90 acres in the rest of the site. Says the newspapers, these are two giants that shall enrich us in 25, 50, and 75 years. Right? Uh, here is the main mall parking lot as it was first developed. 5,500 parking spaces will eventually be created there. It is wise to remember that in 1969, only 12 towns and cities in Maine even had 6,000 people. Everybody in one of those towns could have come and parked here. <laughs> All of this, and new stores are being built in the former parking lot, just like 
two years before it had been a woodlot, just like two years before that it had been farmers' fields. Likewise, if you are going to bring more cars into your city. In those days came the idea of a highway arterial. And a highway arterial was meant to pump cars like the body pumps blood. The pulse of a city can be made to beat quicker, and you can bring more cars to shop in your downtown. But if the expressway is in your way, somebody has to give. From 1969, uh, from 1968, 69 into 70, construction cut across the top of the Portland City Peninsula, Casco Bay to Back Bay. It demolished entire ethnic neighborhoods, Jewish, Italian, Irish, Greek, took 130 or 150 homes and businesses, displaced at least 350 families from what the city declared was a slum like this street. The city put in $4 million and got nine to $12 million federal you know, it was Maine's, one of Maine's largest urban renewal projects of the day. It was, said one city councilor, a monstrous plan. It was, said a city manager, the salvation of our downtown. It saves you two minutes of travel time today. <laughs> the largest sand landfill in the history of the state of Maine is taking place at the top of the 1982 picture. This is a Portland looking toward Back Cove. What has changed between the two pictures is the loss of every elm tree, the addition of the Franklin Street arterial, and the appearance of Franklin Towers, which we'll talk about more in a moment, all emptying out into a sand landfill that we'll see in better pictures in just a moment. And here looking in the other direction, you can see, again, all the elms that are lost, the existence of Franklin Towers Cathedral in the 1970 picture right uh, uh, there on Cumberland Avenue. Initially, this was to have two underground tunnels additionally built or arching bridges across it all. As it happens, they ran out of money before that could be done. But here again, you see the arterial coming up. And here's the sand landfill that I'm telling you about. It will take 1.5 million cubic yards of sand to build this support for Interstate 295. This is just the understory, not the building of the highway itself. 100 trucks a day, each carrying 10 cubic yards, will still take them 22 months just to lay the understory. The sand comes from a pit in West Cumberland, Maine, near Forest Lake. Anybody here from Cumberland Town? Forest Lake Sand Landfill. We took it all, you know, and they ran out of sand and had to go elsewhere uh, for it then. And here you can see the extent of it. If you see an aerial view of Casco Bay and Back Bay, since uh, Portland has been in existence, we filled three-fifths of Back Bay. And they're a wonderful picture taken by a dentist, Dr. Henry Pollard, uh, who is a private pilot and a wonderful photographer, and whose thoughtfulness in 69 lets us see these pictures <coughs> in 2019, City Hall right there in the center. And here you can see the extent of it. Um, down sort of up at uh, 10 o'clock would be uh, Hannaford Brothers today, and there's Franklin Towers catching the light, and above it, the Great Grand Crunk Green Elevator. Remember that? 1.5 billion bushels it could hold, million bushels, excuse me, of wheat, largest grain elevator east of Detroit, uh, now gone. So big it would create its own weather uh, within it. It was disassembled. It makes the beams and the floors of the Samoset Hotel in Rockport to this day. From a quiet crowd to a noisy one in a minute, here's the highway going through East Deering. Let's come back. We're first going to go this. This is, talk about a noisy crowd. The Vietnam War protest of October 1969 in City Hall Plaza was the largest gathering there in the 20th century until the reception of the Olympic athletes in 1984, Joan Benoit Samuelson, uh, Billy Swift. Um, all the planning that has to be done in the midst of all of this is to uh, see if you can balance 
a planning commission, which had existed since 1956, to be a subcommittee of the new Council of Governments. There are 22, I have 30 seconds, oh, five minutes, oh, thank you, good. <laughs> Can you make a active commission of 22 people who are appointed into a subcommittee of the Council of Governments? John Johnson of Gorham, a longtime commissioner, says, no, we, uh, you know, COG is made up of politicals and, and politicians. Uh, public opinion blows hot and cold. Planning should be a steady course. James Bourne of Westbrook said, it's, it's the end rather than the means. It'll all work out all right for us. Well. On the 22nd of September, Franklin Towers finally opens. It is the big kahuna of 1969. It is 16 stories tall, Maine's tallest building then and now. Cost 3.9 million. There are 70 units in it, and they each cost between, on a sliding scale, 47 to 67 dollars a month rent. Here, the director, George Mulligan of the Portland Housing Authority, is presenting keys to the second tenant to move in, uh, Mrs. Uh, Alice Berry. The newspaper records, as some tenants note wistfully, they can look out their new apartment windows down to where the old neighborhood was and where their old home once stood. Now, here it is again, magnificent construction, as you can see. And today, it remains the tallest building in Maine. They make a small fortune out of the antennas, which today uh, stand on, on top of the building. COG and the Planning Commission are racing a deadline. They have to have a plan, or they get no federal money. The plan, this appeared in the 20th of December, 1969, in the papers, will enable the money to come, if they can get it done. The Regional Planning Commission had been founded in 1956. It's thought to be the first and oldest planning commission in New England. COG, you are its linear successor. Now, the plan does get done, and I'm delighted to say that Abe Daly, actually of COG, found a copy of it. And uh, it is uh, here, and I believe our executive director has it. Well worth reading. I would say COG's actual birthday is the 13th of November, 1969 almost the same day as we land on the moon. Yeah, you forget, we landed on the moon twice in 1969. Um, Apollo 12 landed in November. So the Intrepid lifts off in November 1969, and so does GP Cog. You've been uh, flying many a mission since. Henry Warren is the first executive director. A man named Lee Flint of Westbrook is the first elected president. And here is a wonderful picture of some of the very early presidents of COG. I'm hoping, though we have the caption, that you will recognize and remember and thank some of them. You know, we have to leave so much out now. About 1969, trucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Charles Manson murder uh, uh, indictments. Chappaquiddick. The My Lai trials. The Maine income tax. The passing of the great, good Governor Baxter and happy to skip over the worst James Bond movie ever made, starring George Lazenby, the only movie he ever made. You know, 69, as it came, so it goes. Uh, we're back to terrible December storms, back to back, back to back. The worst since 1929, they say. <coughs> Blows out CMP, <coughs> shuts down the television stations, and freezes open the drawbridge. But in Bremerhaven, Germany, the new Prince of Fundy ferry is launched. It will be the first Maine to Nova Scotia ferry. It's named by a youngster, William Mahoney of Yarmouth. Where is he now? And at the old Museum of Natural History, now long destroyed in Portland, a piece of Apollo moon rock is put on exhibit in the last days of the year, just five months after Earthfall, and there's a piece of the moon in Maine. The doors stay open in the dark and the cold air long into the December night. Thousands file by to marvel at it. And above them, high on a balcony rail, hung, as I see in the pictures, the mounted head of a bison, a buffalo. Its glass eyes reflecting, ah, I'll tell you the cost of a new frontier. 
Well, such irony approaches poetry, as does the very last Evening Express editorial of the 1960s, 1970 being just around the corner. I'd like to find the guy who gets a hold of these and shrinks the print. <laughs> Didn't used to be this way. To the rest of the world, they write, we suspect that America is an enigma, rich but dissatisfied, powerful but often impotent to force our will upon others, both selfish and generous, and envied most by those most likely to assail us. But above all, during this turbulent decade, we have continued to carry high the beacon of liberty with all the mistakes we make at home and abroad. Our instincts have been right, and our principles have been sincere. We have always meant to do the right thing. That is America, and that is what really matters as we prepare to welcome the 1970s and the future, which means you. Thank you. So, uh, Abe, because you didn't ever get me my, uh, my stop card, that means I can keep talking? Is that it? Oh, oh. oh too bad, too bad, too bad. Thank you. Thank you.